explain. The Northern Hemisphere owes its temperate climate to the North Atlantic Current. Heat from the sun arrives at the equator and is carried north by the ocean. But global warming is melting the polar ice caps and disrupting this flow. Smaller. Well, this storm here decided to stop, turn around, and come back. Check this out. Here's a little video clip I put together from Zoom Earth of the storm, and you'll see it leaving the, the east coast of the United States and then stopping and doing a complete 360-degree turn. Uh, it's in the process of completing it. Hello everyone, I would like to share something with you the Holy Spirit was talking with me early this morning about. He was saying that the comets and the rocks that are falling to the earth, he said are diseased. They have parasites on them. And uh, he said and they're falling on the land and they're falling into the waters, poisoning the water, poisoning the things in the water. And I said, I never did, I never thought about it like that. And the Holy Spirit said, yes, they're coming from the universe. There are things out there in the universe, uh, that man knows nothing about. And they are connected to these rocks. They are parasites. And when they fall to this earth, they come with those rocks. And the Holy Spirit said, causing diseases and poisoning the water and even poisoning the land in the places that they fall. Andrew Huff is a spokesman for the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute, which has been leading the Pentagon's quest for a more effective antidote to radiation sickness. The symptoms of acute radiation sickness would be just exactly like a terrible flu. A person would have a headache. They would feel very tired. They would have a little bit of a fever. They might have some vomiting at higher doses. All of this would be more severe and it would come on more rapidly. Acute radiation poisoning, which is serious, and it comes in four phases. First is prodromal. This is vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, anorexia, and more radiation makes this worse. It can hit you within a few minutes or days after an exposure. Second, you'd actually feel better. This is called the latent phase. You'd get over these flu-like symptoms but you didn't actually get over them. If you'd had lab tests, they would show that you'd been poisoned by radiation. At survivable doses, it would come on within about six to 24 hours, and it would be over within two days. And you might think, well, I'm, I'm okay. Then maybe weeks after that, bam, the manifest illness phase hits. That's when a bunch of bad stuff happened too. And then four is recovery or death. But really what's happening is the, the body is losing its platelet supply and its neutrophil supply. It's not clear what happens, but doctors think your cardiovascular system and central nervous system swell with fluid thanks to damaged cells. In less than three days, the brain can't control the body anymore because of cell death. And, and in order for you to feel sick from that, just like after chemotherapy, it takes a little while for infectious to, infections to come up, to, to, to come about, or for you to have any kind of bleeding from the loss of platelets. Because radiation is damaging DNA at the atomic level, acute poisoning is very hard to treat. Radaway does. That exceeds anatomical borders. It simply crosses the uh, the lower fissure here, uh, but it's got relatively sharp margins, and that those two are key features for radiation pneumonitis. So so that's the key feature, uh, consolidation exceeding anatomical borders, but with sharp margins reflecting the radiation part. Oh. This is a There's a lot of strange things like this, and I wanted to point out some other ones that just seem... It's like the overall, everybody's acting different, okay? I'm really getting this uh, impression here. Um, he says he has these weird 
phantasmagorical um, you know, dreams or experiences as a result of this, kind of like making you, th you know, think strange things. And maybe that's related to this here. Maybe this is happening to him. I don't know. But there's a lot of strange things like this. And also you have this. This was kind of curious. Now, I don't know what to think about this. I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the date on here, I was just noticing is, um, 14 August 1978, which is just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought. Which at that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet-to-be-discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system, and this naturally led directly to you and your interest in what we're doing, and that's when you, you sent me this book. You have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some 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 time years ago uh, of of a, a celestial body which you I think named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or or, or somehow uh, turned on on their side both Uranus and Pluto. And uh, we've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture, at least in your own mind, of what we are talking about, the big planet, the small planet. Uh, for more than half a century, Carlos Munoz Ferrada astonished people with his astronomical and geophysical predictions. On January 19, 1939, he predicted that on January 24, at 7.10 p.m., an earthquake would devastate Chile. On January 24, 1939, at 11.29 p.m., a huge, devastating earthquake hit and it left 10,000 people dead. He continued to foretell many historic earthquakes and other geothermal events throughout his lifetime. Astronomically, he discovered new comets and planets. He discovered their trajectories and orbital motions with this amazing accuracy. And at the age of 90, Carlos Munoz Ferrada finally broke his silence and he told about his 59 years of research pertaining to Herculobus, or what he referred to as the Comet Planet. Porque usted nos habla y nos dice que es cometa planeta porque su movimiento no es algo normal. No. Que tiene unas velocidades. Es un cometa planeta porque tiene órbita elíptica como cometa. Y porque tiene gran masa. Como planeta. Como planeta. Yo lo llamo entonces planeta cometa. O sea, un planeta con cola. Is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then its, its mass would be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet. Uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. Is the orbit that I have proposed for... Entonces aquí, en este gráfico, usted nos muestra, en el gráfico, ¿verdad?, de que en este lado está la Tierra la órbita de nuestra Tierra alrededor del Sol. Sí, señor. Y que él penetra 
en la órbita terrestre aquí, pasando muy cerca de nuestro de nuestra tierra entonces tarda de 14 este... millones de kilómetros 14 millones de kilómetros entonces acá usted en su gráfico nos presenta lo que es la estrella muerta o el sol muerto este. Este. en ese sol muerto él gira aquí a 92 kilómetros por segundo entonces además de esos 92 kilómetros por segundo él tiene otra velocidad que es la más aterradora verdad que es la que se mueve muy rápido tiene tres velocidades hombre o sea un milésimo de la velocidad de la luz eso es rápido uh. este cuerpo no va a pasar desapercibido todo el mundo lo ve y va a haber gran confusión más que confusión y le van a, a dar un sinnúmero de interpretaciones a este asunto uh. ¿qué consecuencias sobre nuestro planeta? la más terrorífica luego cada cual arregle las como puede que hace 13.000 años que no penetró y que 13.000 años atrás fue en los tiempos de Atlántida perdida tiene resonancia y efectos que a los reflejos que a la debilidad queda el gran cambio ese gran cambio, el cual usted viene estudiando de mil, desde 1940, ¿verdad?, que viene estudiando ese astro, van 59 años de documentación. Eh, ese gran cambio es humano, además es a la Tierra, porque indica un cambio de polos. Es geofísico y humano. Geofísico y humano. Y se sí. habla de que va a haber un cambio de los polos magnéticos de la Tierra. Son tantas las cosas que lamentable la humanidad no está preparada. El cambio viene. La destrucción viene. Y no es que nada afectará a la humanidad en su existencia, en su producción en su subsistencia misma. Parasites, things that are connected to these fallen stars that we don't know anything about. And the Holy Spirit said that they are coming to this earth through those comets and those things that are falling. The Cree prophecy of the Warrior of the Rainbow is basically that there will come a time in this planet's lifetime where the rivers and plants and earth will start to poison us. Everything that we've used will start to harm us. And when that time comes, basically everyone in the world, people from all different creeds and backgrounds and cultures have to come together and stand up together as warriors of the rainbow we have to take back the earth and reclaim it for ourselves and now is really the time thank you for watching and much love to you all